Hi, today we're going to talk about impulse and momentum. Here are the goals for the session. Well, we'll just talk about momentum and how we use momentum to analyze physical situations. And we're going to look at impulse. And the impulse is the product of the net force and the time during which that net force acts. And the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So let's go back and review Newton's second law a little bit. So when we, write down, when we wrote down Newton's uh, second law, we wrote down that the sum of all the forces, or the net force, is the mass times the acceleration. So we're going to rewrite this in a little bit different way. So here's F net equals MA. But A, we can go back to the definition of the acceleration and write A as delta V over delta T. Now we get F net is M times delta V over delta T. The final step, we just shove the M inside the delta sign. Okay? Now, can we get away with that? Well, we can do that if the mass is constant. But it turns out that actually this statement that F net is delta MV over delta T is actually true in general. And we've just been applying it to the special case where the mass is constant. Okay, and this was actually the version that Newton uh, used himself, that the net force is the change in this quantity m times velocity, mass times velocity, over the time interval. And this is a much more general version than the one we've been using, because uh, this one also accounts for situations in which an object changes in mass. And a good example of that is a rocket. And a rocket just continually spews um, gas out the back and there's mass that goes with that. So it's taking the mass of the fuel and uh, ejecting a lot of it out the back. So you can apply this more general version of Newton's second law to that scenario. We're not really going to do that, at least not much. We're not going to worry about situations in which mass changes, but we're going to use the equation in this form, F net is delta mv over delta t and see what we, can get at, what we can get out of that. But note that it's just totally consistent with what we've done before. It's really nothing new. Uh, it's just a different version of Newton's second law. But it'll give us some new insights. So let's start talking about what we call impulse. So there's Newton's version of the second law of motion. And we're just going to rearrange this a little bit, and we'll get what we call the impulse equation. So, here we go. The impulse is the product of the net force multiplied by the time over which the time interval during which that net force uh, acts. So, once again, this is really not a new idea. It's completely consistent with Newton's second law. Again, we've just gotten it by rewriting Newton's second law a little bit. Okay, so it sounds new, but it's actually not. Impulse F net delta T is delta MV. Okay, so what we've got here is the fact that there's some quantity, mass times velocity, and the change in that quantity is directly connected to the net force multiplied by the time during which that net force acts. Okay, so let's invent a name for this quantity, m times v. What names can you come up with? How about we call this momentum? Now we have momentum and impulse we can talk about. So let's just summarize some of the basic ideas about momentum. Momentum, m times v, is a vector. It points in the direction of the velocity. The symbol we generally use for momentum is p, because momentum starts with p. Uh, no. I guess we used up m already, so we had to go to p. So p, with a little vector symbol on top, the vector p, the momentum, is the mass times v with a vector symbol, the velocity. So momentum is mass times velocity. Anytime an object experiences a net force, its momentum will change. And this change in momentum is given by this impulse equation. Delta P, the change in momentum, is the net force multiplied by the time interval. Let's talk about conservation. 
a little bit. This is not conservation in a bio biological sense, okay? This is in a physics sense. So when physicists say the quantity is conserved, what are they talking about? Well, this is a very simple idea. It's just the fact that a quantity has the same value at all times. So if a quantity is conserved, it's got the same value at all times. So let's talk specifically about momentum conservation. So we know that momentum changes when a net force acts on a system. Of course, the longer a net force acts, the larger the change in momentum. But we're trying to talk about conservation, so we're trying to talk about something that doesn't change. So what if no net force acted on a system? What would happen? Well, in that case, there'd be no reason for the momentum to change. The way to change momentum is to apply a net force. If you don't apply a net force, then the momentum of the system is conserved. It maintains its value. So let's apply this to colliding carts. So you've probably seen this exact scenario in the lab. Two carts collide on a track. These guys are moving in opposite directions. The carts are actually identical. Cart 1 has a mass of 500 grams, or half a kilogram, and it's got a velocity of 20 centimeters per second to the right. Cart 2 is simply a mirror image of cart 1. Same mass, uh, same speed, and it's just the velocity is directed in the opposite direction to cart 1's velocity. So, what is the net momentum of the two-cart system? So to find the net momentum, you can add the momentum of cart 1 to the momentum of cart 2. However, you always have to remember that momentum is a vector. Okay? So in this case, the net momentum of the, of the two-cart system is zero because you've got cart 1 with a, a momentum directed to the right. Cart 2 has an equal and opposite momentum directed to the left. So when you combine them, they combine to be zero. So each cart individually has a momentum, but combined, the system, two-cart system, has zero net momentum. Okay, let's keep going. So when these carts collide, cart one applies a force to cart two, cart two applies a force back to cart one. But no net external force is acting on the system here. So do we believe that? Let's see, gravity acts on both the carts. However, they're on a track here, so there's a normal force also on cart one and, and on cart two. And that upward normal force on each cart exactly balances the downward force of gravity acting on each cart. So there are external forces acting, but there's no net external force acting. In each case, the force of gravity is, is uh, balanced by the normal force. So in this case, the net momentum of the system must keep, be conserved. And we already showed that momentum is zero in the system, so it's got to be zero the whole time, even during the collision, after the collision, whatever. So what about cart one's momentum? When it collides with cart 2, is its momentum going to be conserved? And the answer to that is no. And that's because cart 1 experiences a net external force. It's that force applied by cart 2. And of course, cart 2's momentum will also change because it's going to experience a uh, force, net force, from cart 1 during this collision. So if the individual Cart's momenta change, how can the momentum of the system be conserved? Let's analyze that a little bit. So this gets back to a force graph, force versus time. This is cart one's force versus time graph, the one cart one experiences as it's colliding with cart two. And you've seen graphs like this too. Okay, uh, here we've defined right to be positive. So you see the force is going negative on cart 1. That's because cart 1 is going to feel a force to the left during its collision with cart 2. Uh, note that the units on time here are milliseconds, so this is taking about 10 milliseconds, this collision. Okay. Now, what we know is that the change of momentum for cart 1 is actually the area under the net force versus time graph. Okay. So in if in the case where the net force is constant, 
then it's pretty easy to work out the momentum. It's just that constant value of the force multiplied by the whole time that force is applied. If you have a variable force like we have in this case, then all you got to do is work out the area under the curve, the net force versus time graph, and you've got your change in momentum. Okay, so what do you think the area under the net force versus time graph is for CART 2? Okay, so when we stick CART 2's force graph on here, what are we going to get? Well, you've seen that before. This is a consequence of Newton's third law. If CART 2 applies a force to CART 1, CART 1 applies an equal and opposite force back on CART number 2. So the areas under the curves have the same magnitude and opposite signs. So momentum conservation is actually just a consequence of Newton's third law. So two colliding objects come together. Each one individually experiences a change in momentum, but the change in momenta are equal and opposite because of the fact that the force versus time graphs are mirror images of one another. Okay, and this is again true when the net external force is zero. Okay, and that's true for our two cart system here. So cart one's change of momentum is always equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to cart two's change in momentum. And note that this applies to all collisions. It's not just collisions that we set up in the lab with these cars on the tracks, but any collisions at all. As long as no net external force acts on the system, and you can often apply that even to cars colliding on the street. If you look at the situation immediately before the collision and then immediately afterwards, you say, well, there's no real time for which a uh, net force can change things. So in these collisions, uh, collisions of football players, hockey players, whatever, that's also true. Momentum is conserved in those cases too. Okay, so that is it for today about momentum, impulse, and conservation of momentum.